Hello, so we begin with a new chapter on inner product spaces. This is material for week number four and this is lecture 9a. So this inner product space is basically a generalization of the usual dot product that you're familiar in three-dimensional space and that you're studied in your 12th standard. So let's get to the <clears throat> definitions let v be a vector space you can think of v as a subspace of rn and what is an inner product an inner product on v is a function that assigns to each pair of vectors v1 v2 a real number so it's a function from v cross v to r and the value of the function is usually denoted by triangular bracket v1 comma v2 this is a standard notation which is used everywhere and the vector space is a real where the scalars are real numbers so what should this function satisfy what should this uh, this function of two variables satisfy what are the requ requisite properties the requisite properties are linearity in each variable or it should be bilinear what does it mean to say that it is bilinear you keep the second variable fixed and you change the first variable and write v1 as a sum of two vectors v1 prime plus v1 double prime then the output must be the sum of the corresponding outputs namely the sum of v1 prime v2 plus v1 double prime v2 this is called and then you should have scalar when you multiply the first variable v1 by alpha keep the second vari second v2 intact the alpha comes out so the triangular bracket alpha v1 comma v2 is alpha times triangular bracket v1 v2. So this will be linearity in the first variable. Likewise, you want linearity with respect to the second variable. So when you replace v2 by v2 prime plus v2 double prime, keep the first variable intact. The output should be the sum of the corresponding outputs v1 comma v2 double v2 prime plus v1 comma v2 double prime. Likewise, when I multiply the second <clears throat> argument by alpha keep the first argument intact the alpha must come out star so linearity with respect to the second in other words you call this a bilinear map of course you need one more condition just by bilinearity is not enough to qualify to become an inner product we need what is called as positive definiteness that means that the inner product of vv must be uh, <clears throat> non-negative and it must be strictly positive strict positive I emphasize the V dot V or the triangular bracket of V with itself should be positive specifically not equal to zero for all non zero vectors when the when the when the vector is zero it would be zero because if I take alpha equal to zero in star <clears throat> if I take Z, if I would one of the variables V W is zero then the output will be zero so in a product with zero with itself is of course zero but if i take a non zero vector then in a, in a product of v with itself should be strictly positive this is a very very important requirement positive definiteness so this is the definition of an inner product the most example most important example of course is the dot product <clears throat> take two vectors x1 x2 xn and y1 y2 yn and what is the dot product of x, uh, of these two vectors x1 y1 plus x2 y2 plus dot 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 plus xn yn this is a familiar dot product in r3 when n equal to 3 this is a generalization of the familiar concepts that you already studied <clears throat> in your 12th standard let us look at another example so now this time i'm going to since it's a different inner product i'm using a different i'm, I'm just denoting it but double triangular bracket just to emphasize that it's an uh, that on or there are several examples of inner product there are several functions from v cross v to r which satisfy these properties one of them is the a usual dot product there are some other examples as well now in, so i modify this definition the usual dot product i try to i try to tweak it a little bit i, I put a c1 here a c2 here da 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 a cn so c1 x1 y1 plus c2 x2 y2 plus da 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 plus cn x and y a small modification where c1 c2 cn are positive real numbers the positivity is required because of this positive definiteness requirement here it is for this reason that these scale that these c1 c2 so i just included some kind of a weightage weights c1 c2 cn and I'll, again i can verify it's easy for you to verify that these properties are all satisfied it is bilinear if i keep one vector fixed and i replace the other vector by a sum of two vectors it will be the corresponding sum of the inputs and so on and so forth
So this will be pretty easy for you to verify these properties. So that's an inner product. That's another example of an inner product. I'm going to give an example which is not an inner product. X1, Y1, X2, Y2, Xn, Y1. Y, sorry, X, 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 sorry, excuse me. X1, X2, Xn. Y1, Y2, Yn. The, the product of these is x1, y1 plus x2, y2 plus dot, 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 xn minus 1, yn minus 1, minus xn, y. You may have encountered this in your physics courses when you study special theory of relativity. This is called the Lorenzian form. This is called the Lorenzian form. This Lorenzian form is not an inner product. Why is it not an inner product? It's not an inner product simply because it is bilinear. These conditions, these four conditions are satisfied. What is not going to be satisfied is a positive definiteness. It's not going to satisfy this property. VV, triangular bracket VV is strictly positive. I'd like you to produce a V. I'd like you to come up with a V for which, <clears throat> v, uh, for, which the, for which the product of V with itself is not positive. And so it will not qualify to be a <clears throat> inner product. Another example let us take. Let us take a two by two matrix. A11, A12, A21, A22, which is symmetric. A symmetric 2 by 2 matrix, real entries, real symmetric matrix, whose determinant is positive, and the sum of the diagonal entries A11 plus A22. A11, when you take a square matrix, A11 plus A22 plus A33, that's called a trace. So they say that the determinant is positive and the trace is also positive. So you've got a 2 by 2 real symmetric matrix with, whose determinant is positive and whose trace, that is, sum of the diagonal entries, is positive. Now I'm going to cook up an inner product. <clears throat> I'm going to take I'm going to take two vectors x1, x2, and y1, y2. What is the product of them? Take the row vector x1, x2, matrix A, column vector y1, y2. When you have to do the matrix multiplication, you're going to get a real number. 1 by 2, 2 by 2, 2 by 1. The product is going to be a 1 by 1 matrix or a real number. That is going to be an inner product. Well, again, you will be see that these properties are very readily verified. It's almost obvious that these things are true. What you need to check is this happens. What you need to check is this happens. And I'd like you to seriously think about why it is positive definite. And you need these conditions. The determinant is positive and the trace is positive. And under these two conditions, this will become an inner product. And instead of taking two by two matrices, we can take n cross n matrix. And approve, but of course, these conditions will have to become will become more complicated to describe. There will be more conditions, just not just these two. And not this kind of condition. Tra that the trace is going to be a11 plus a22 plus dot 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 plus a n n. The determinant of an n cross n matrix. They should, of course, be positive, but something more is also required. So with some additional lots of conditions, this will become an inner product. The, mat the matter can be generalized to Rn. We shall see this <coughs> later. For example, you can try to think of a 3 by 3 matrix. What would be the generalization to a 3 by 3 matrix? You might struggle with it to come up. See, always we, are, we do something for 2 by 2 case, and then we see whether it can, it, it can be generalized to the 3 by 3 case. The idea is to guess what would be the correct generalization and then try to see whether you can prove that your guess is correct or come up with a counter example to show that the guess is wrong. That's a usual game. So you might struggle with it a little bit to come up with an appropriate condition. You will, you will guess that determinant should be positive and A11 plus A22 plus A33 must be positive. What, what more? We will see. I'll, we will see the answer later. But if you want, you can try some experimentations if you will. So, so we got now a new concept, an inner product space. An inner product space is a new concept that now you've been introduced to. So whenever you start a new chapter and, and some new concepts are there, there'll be some terminologies associated with it and some small results. Uh, you begin by proving some simple results which are useful, some simple consequences of the definitions. So let us get some terms. The triangular bracket is the notation that is always used and uh, for an inner product. The two vectors v1 and v2 are said to be orthogonal or perpendicular if the inner product is 0. v1, the inner product of v1 and v2 is 0, then we say that v1 and v2 are perpendicular. If one of the vectors is 0 and the other vector is arbitrary, 
it's going to be zero. So the zero vector is orthogonal to everything. The zero vector is orthogonal to everything. A vector is going to be a set of a unit vector if inner product of V with itself is one. Usual generalizations. What you study in your 12th standard, the usual thing simply generalizes and it simply, the definitions simply writes, write themselves out. No, no thinking is required. What are the unit vector? No prizes for guessing. What, what is orthogonality? Zero vector is orthogonal to everything. What is orthogonality? No prizes for guessing. It's obvious. Now, you may have seen this in your elementary high school geometry. You have studied the theorem of Apollonius. ABC is a triangle. From A, you draw median, right? Joining, you draw the median joining A and the midpoint of BC end, right? What is the theorem of Apollonius? AB squared plus AC squared is twice BM squared plus twice CM squared. That's the uh, that's the theorem of Apollonius, right? Sorry. Twice BM squared plus twice AM squared. That's the theorem of Apollonius. And then using the theorem of Apollonius, you can prove the parallelogram law. That if you take a parallelogram, some of the squares on the sides of the parallelogram equals some of the squares in the diagonals. This you have studied in your high school. It's called the parallelogram law. Now this is not just, just true for planes and parallelograms sitting in the plane. It is true in general. In any inner product space, in any inner product space, this is true. Well, I not include. I, I should have uh, said this. Here, I, I have circled this in red. VV, the dot product of V with itself, or the inner product of V with itself will be denoted by norm V square. And norm V is going to be square root of V dot. Okay. So, the, uh, so what does the parallelogram law say? Take any inner product space whatsoever, in particular the standard inner product in Rn, the usual dot product in Rn, in that included. This law is true. If I take two vectors v1 and v2, then norm of v1 plus v2 square plus norm of v1 minus v2 square is twice norm of v1 square plus norm of v2 square. Proof simplicity itself. What is norm of v1 plus v2 squared? Look at the definition of norm. Norm of v1 plus v2 squared will be inner product of v1 plus v2 itself. So take inner product of v1 plus v2, inner product with v1 plus v2. What is norm of v1 minus v2 squared? Inner product of v1 minus v2 with inner product with itself. Expand by linearity, you know, linear with respect to each variable. So you will get four. So fix the second argument and you will get two terms. And each of the two terms will further give you two more terms. So you, when you when you write when you write the when you write this out, when you write this when you write this out, you're going to get four terms. Which are the four terms? V1 in a product with V1, V1 in a product with V2, V2 in a product with V1, and V2 in a product with V2. For the second one, again you'll get four terms, but two of them will appear with negative signs. When you add them up, <coughs> there will be some cancellations. What are you left with? V1 dot, V1 dot V1, that is, and uh, but that is twice appearing twice, so twice norm V1 squared plus twice norm V2 squared, that is a parallelogram law. That completes the proof of the parallelogram law. Then next comes the theorem of Pythagoras. If you take, again, you can figure out why this is called the theorem of Pythagoras, because it's a usual, gen, it's a generalization of a familiar theorem that you have studied in high school geometry. If V1 and V2 are orthogonal, then norm of v1 plus v2 squared is norm v1 squared plus norm v2 squared. Let us do the, let us simply get to the proof directly without any fuss. Left hand side is v1 plus v2 dot v1 plus v2. Four terms will come out when you expand it. Two of them will cancel out because v1 and v2 are orthogonal. You will be left with norm v1 squared plus norm v2 squared. The proof of Pythagoras' theorem is over. Now, the, the Pythagoras' theorem will be immediately used to prove one of the most important results called the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. The Cauchy-Schwarz inequality says that if V is an inner product space, any inner product space, in particular the dot product in Rn, if you like, that for that included, that's a, you, you, you know this Cauchy-Schwarz inequality for that case, it is true in general. 
if V is any inner product space and V1 and V2 are two vectors in V, then modulus of the dot product of V1 and V2 is less than or equal to norm V1 into norm V2. Equality holds if and only if V1 and V2 are linearly dependent. That is if and only if V1 and V2 are collinear. That is if and only if V2 is a multiple of V1 or V1 is a multiple of V2. Okay. So this is the uh, theorem. Of course, if V1 and V2 are orthogonal, if V1 and V2 are orthogonal, the inequality is obvious. Because the left hand side is zero and the right hand side is non-negative. Finished. Of course, now if V1 and V2 is, if V1 and V2 are orthogonal and if equality holds, then what happens? Suppose if V1 and V2 are orthogonal and equality holds, then V1 must be 0 or V2 must be 0. Okay. So, uh, and, the, and, the, and the vectors are linearly, linearly dependent because equality holds, you're saying, no? Equality holds, you're saying, so norm V1 into norm v2 is 0. So norm v1 must be 0 or norm v2 must be 0. Norm v1 is 0 means inner product of v1 with itself is 0. And that will happen only when v1 is 0. Or if norm v2 is 0 means v2 must be 0. So that is the state of affairs. Now let us come to the case. So the, so the case where the two vectors are orthogonal is finished. Now let us come to the case where the two vectors are not orthogonal. Again, um, well, of course, this this comment should not be there because if v1 and v2 are both zero, again we are back to this back to the back to the earlier case. Because if v1 and v2 are both zero, then then really nothing. It's it's really a very then nothing at all in this inequality. It's zero equal to zero. So v1 not equal to zero, v2 not equal to zero. Okay. So I'm going to assume uh, and I'm going to assume that uh, v1 is not equal to zero. I'm going to assume that v1 is not equal to zero. If v1 is not equal to zero, then norm of v1 is not equal to zero. I'm going to divide by norm v1. I'm going to divide by norm v1. Norm v1 is always a positive number. So it goes inside the absolute value. And by linearity, by linearity of the inner product, I can take the norm right inside and put it right underneath v1, underneath v1. So what does the inequality read? The inequality that we are supposed to prove simply can be recast in the form mod v1 by norm v1, comma v2, less than or equal to norm v2. Correct? That is, I'm going to write it as a mod inner product w this v1 by norm v1 i'm going to call it w1 i'm going to call this abbreviate it as w1 w1 inner product with v2 that mod is less than or equal to norm v2 okay now this w1 is a unit vector it's a vector of length one so it is enough to prove this it's enough to prove this inequality okay so what do you do in physics you got a unit vector w1 and you got another vector v2 okay so now you will resolve, right? I mean, in your physics courses, you will resolve a vector v2 in the direction of w1 and in the direction which is in the tangential component and normal component, right? You always do this in physics. For example, a, a, a body sliding down an inclined plane, you will just, you have been doing that kind of problems a lot. So what we are what we are doing is that we are sub, what is the tangential what is the component of v2 in the direction of w1 you have to take the dot product v2 with w1 and then that's the number that's a magnitude of the uh, tangential component and the direction is of course v1 w1 itself so that's the tangential component subtract the tangential component what is left over is a normal component so this v2 tilde is in your familiar physics terminology the normal component of v2 the component of v2 in the direction normal to w1 so that everybody sees. so we got all that this is your w1 w2 the tangential component has been subtracted off and you lift the normal component now let us see now of course by definition if it is a normal component that means it's going to be orthogonal to w1 no? that has to happen by geometry, but let us verify it algebraically. This is linear algebra. So since it's an algebra course, our geometry is supposed to just be a crutch or an intuition. And so we should verify everything algebraically. Let us verify it algebraically. Let us take the dot product and check. It works. So W, so V2 tilde and W1 are orthogonal. If they're orthogonal, I can apply Pythagoras' theorem. No? If, if V2 tilde is orthogonal to W1, 
V2 theta is going to be orthogonal to every multiple of W1 also. It's going to be orthogonal to 2 W1, 3 W1, alpha W1. And I choose my alpha to be this number. I, I choose my alpha to be this scalar. Okay, so V2 theta is orthogonal to a scalar multiple of W1. So apply up the Pythagoras theorem. If I apply the Pythagoras theorem, V2 theta plus this norm square will be equal to norm of V2 theta square plus norm of this square, right? So therefore, but but what is what will happen if I add to the V if I add to V2 theta this particular object? What am I going to get? What what is this thing inside? Or what, what is this thing? V2 theta plus dot product of V2 W1 times W1. Look at the definition of V2 theta. If I, if I put if I take this on the left hand side, I'm going to get V2 only. So I'm going to get V2 norm V2 squared equal to norm V2 theta squared plus this will come out V2 W1 mod will mod squared will come out. Norm W1 is 1 because W1 is a unit vector, right? So V2 so V2 norm squared equal to V2 theta norm squared plus absolute value V2 W1 squared. Now I'm going to knock off, I'm going to forget about this W V2 theta and it, the equality will become an inequality. And that's exactly what you wanted to prove, right? No mod V2 W1 less than or equal to norm W2. Norm V2, sorry. That's exactly what we wanted to prove, remember? That's exactly what it what is that? We have completed the proof. Okay, so when will equality hold? Equality will hold if when will equality hold in this inequality? Equality will hold in this inequality only when, if and only if equality will hold, if and only if this V whatever I knocked off must be zero. Then only it will be an equality. Otherwise, it will become strict inequality. This V2 tilde is if V2 tilde norm squared is positive, this inequality will be strict. It will be equal if and only if V2 tilde is 0. V2 tilde is 0 means what? V2 tilde is 0 means what? Let us look at the definition of V2 tilde. V2 tilde is 0. That will happen if and only if V2 is a multiple of w, or W1. But W1 is a multiple of V1 anyway. So V2 tilde is 0 if and only if V2 and V1 are proportional. If and only V2 and V1 are proportional. So that completes the proof of the Cauchy Schwarz inequality. Let's let us now prove the next little theorem. The Cauchy Schwarz inequality, you must have now you must have noticed that the proof is pretty pretty uh, simple and sweet. You might have thought that in your Cauchy Schwarz inequality that you have studied in your earlier courses, you have seen the proof of the Cauchy Schwarz inequality that involves some tricks and stuff like that because you are trying to do it in a very general, I mean, you are trying to do it in the setting of dot products in Rn and you didn't have that you didn't have the technology of inner product spaces. But here we are, we are introduced an abstract concept of an inner product space and in an axiomatic framework we are doing it because and so here the proof appears very, very transparent. The transparency of the argument is now brought out. Okay. So now let us take the next theorem. Suppose V is a vector space endowed with an inner product triangular bracket. And we have non-zero vectors v1, v2, vk. We have got non-zero vectors which are orthogonal. We've got a bunch of non-zero vectors which are orthogonal. Then those vectors are linearly independent. The non-zero must be an important hypothesis because zero is always orthogonal to anything. So I can take v1 to be zero and v2 to be non-zero, and they are they are orthogonal. But I but then the set consisting of zero vectors always linearly dependent so it is very important to put this non-zero it is very important to put this non-zero hypothesis we've got non-zero vectors which are orthogonal then they are linearly independent of course one reason is very simple we've got non-zero vectors which are orthogonal so vi dot vj vi dot vj is zero if i is not equal to j and it is non-zero if i is equal to j. So what happens to the gram matrix? The gram matrix, the gram determinant is simply has diagonal entries, non-zero. Off diagonal entries are all zero. So gram determinant is directly not zero. Therefore, by whatever we had done earlier, these vectors are linearly independent. Quick, one line, one line, one line uh, proof. But let us not make this theorem depend on an earlier theorem on gram determinants. 
let us give an independent and direct simple direct proof suppose the vectors v1 v2 vk are linearly dependent that means there exists scalars c1 c2 ck not all zero such that star holds that means c1 v1 plus c2 v2 plus dot 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 plus ck vk is zero i can always rename the vectors v1 v2 vk and i might i might jolly well assume that ck is not zero and if ck is not zero i might uh, i might even i could even divide by ck but i have not done this here so take dot product take dot product of both sides with v vk if i take the dot product with vk i get c1 dot product of v1 vk plus dot 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 ck vk dot vk is zero but all the previous terms are going to be zero because v1 is orthogonal to sorry vk is orthogonal to v1 v2 vk minus 1 vk is perpendicular to all the previous ones so all the previous one terms will drop out you are simply left with v ck vk dot vk is zero but remember vk is a non zero vector remember vk is a non zero vector so this would force ck to be zero but we have assumed ck is non zero remember that's a contradiction or you can say that or you can argue the other way around we have assumed ck ck is non zero so i can divide by ck and i'm forced i'm i'm forcibly concluding vk vk is zero and that forces me to conclude vk is zero which is again a contradiction because i assume that vk is non zero so whichever way you want to complete the argument it's up to you so it the theorem is The, hereby established. All right. The converse is obviously not true. These two vectors, one zero and one one, are linearly independent. We are obviously not orthogonal. The dot product is one. Angle between two vectors. So, what is the angle between two vectors in R three? In R three, what is the dot product of two vectors? The magnitude of v one into magnitude of v two into cos theta. And then you will say that cos theta, and then you will take cos inverse of. v dot w divided by magnitude of v to magnitude of w. That's what you have been doing in twelfth standard. Now the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality tells you that you can do this in general. Let let capital V be any inner product space. You can do this in any inner product space. You take you have taken two non-zero vectors v and w. You have taken a two non-zero vectors v and w. And what happens? The Cauchy-Schwarz inequality will tell you that absolute value of Dot product of v and w is less than or equal to absolute norm of v into norm of w. So this inner product v w divided by norm v norm w is between minus one and one. Now cosine, remember that there is a unique angle theta in the interval zero to pi, closed interval zero to pi, such that cos theta is going to be the inner product of v v upon norm v and w upon norm w. This the, this unique theta is called the angle between the vectors v and w. Or equivalently, the angle between the unit vectors v upon norm v and w upon norm u is called the is, is this unique angle theta. This angle is pi by two if and only if v and w are orthogonal. So I think with this we will stop this capsule here. We'll continue and uh, we'll continue with this later.